Dear listeners, once again we are back with stories by Ronald Burns. If you enjoyed Ronald's story, be sure to explore more of his literature on Amazon. We've added links to his work in the description box below, so you can easily dive into his captivating storytelling. Also please like the video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell notification icon. Now let's get on with the story. The best marital advice I ever heard was from the Kenny Rogers song, Gambler. He was referring to cards, but I think the lyrics also describe my marriage. Know when to walk away and know when to run. If your wife loves you, you can't stop her from loving you, and if she stops loving you, you can't make her again love you. I'm Steve, I'm average height, with brown hair and brown eyes. You wouldn't mistake me for a movie star, but I look okay. I worked as a copy machine salesman when I met Linda at her office in Spanish Harlem in New York City. I was immediately smitten by her and said that if I could make and sell copies of her, I'd soon be a billionaire. She was flattered and accepted my offer of lunch where I bought her a dozen roses from a florist next to the restaurant. I called her my rose from Spanish Harlem. We were both in our early 20s. Linda was living with her former college roommate Kate. Linda and I hit it off, dated, lived together and married. Her roommate friend Kate hated me on sight and our relationship went down from there. I think she was jealous that I had stolen Linda from her. Every few months Linda and Kate would speak on the phone and an hour later Linda would start an argument with me. The arguments always began. Well, Kate says, Kate called me a show-off because I owned a motorcycle, I was a misogynist because I watched an occasional football game on TV, and a tyrant because in her eyes I refused to allow my wife to have a job. I never stopped her from working, she just didn't want to. I didn't understand why that was my fault, or even bad. She liked me paying for her every whim and desire including a BMW and more shoes and especially boots than the Rockets could wear in one day. What does Kate know about heterosexual relationships? I would ask and then answer, absolutely nothing. I never asked my wife if she had ever been intimate with Kate. Once however she volunteered that she hadn't. I chose to believe her. When she wasn't speaking to Kate, she was a wonderful, though weak-willed wife and mother who always bought into the latest fad hyped by Oprah. A few years later I was promoted to sales manager at our Los Angeles office at a 50% increase in salary. I was happy to get away from the stifling humidity of New York and also Kate's constant interference with my marriage. We agreed that once we had children Linda would stop working and that's what we did 10 months after the Los Angeles move. More promotions and more salary increases gave us the opportunity to live the lives we wanted, with the big house, the big cars and of course the big dog. We were happy for the most part, at least I was and Linda seemed to be except after she spoke with Kate on the phone. We had many fights over her desire to visit New York and Kate. I told her that such a visit would end in our divorce, so she relented and didn't go. When she asked if Kate could visit and stay with us, I screamed my refusal so loudly that my throat became hoarse. Years later I dropped off Linda, my sweet loving wife, and Sue, our youngest daughter at the airport. Sue was starting NYU and Linda was going with her to help her move into her dorm. I couldn't take off from work so I wasn't going with them. At the airport as I helped lift their bags from the car Linda explained that she would also see her friend Kate. Kate who was a lesbian who was madly in love with my wife. I begged Linda not to travel to see Kate because no good ever came from those visits. Short of handcuffing my wife to a radiator, there was no way to stop her visit. Three weeks later at the airport I picked up a mean hateful shrew who no longer even looked like my wife Linda. My Linda had long dark black hair. This bitch had short blonde hair with blue streaks dyed throughout. She started in on me as soon as we left the airport parking lot. When my light turned green the car in front of me in the northbound lane was too preoccupied on his cell phone to move so I honked. When I honked a car in the westbound lane, may have thought he had to move and race through his red light and plowed into a car. My wife turned to me and said I hope you're satisfied now that you caused a car accident. I was floored. You don't drive through a red light no matter who honks at you. That wasn't the end of the argument but merely the beginning. Linda claimed that according to Kate, all of my success in business was because of Linda and she was tired of never receiving credit for it. When I asked her to explain, she just repeated the same phrase without any substantiating. I have always appreciated you as a wife and mother. I have always been generous with my praise of you, but other than keeping the home fires burning, what specifically have you done to help me sell copier machines? Linda thought for a moment, and then said she provided me with clean white shirts every day before I went to work or sales calls. Without those shirts, I would never have made a sale. You're absolutely right. I quickly agreed. My father had taught me to never and I mean never argue with a fool, because you can't win. On the way home, my wife informed me that while she was in New York, she and her friend Kate attended a week-long seminar on the modern woman and her new reality while taking some mind-altering drugs. 
The more she explained about the seminar, the more it seemed like indoctrination into a cult, with limited sleep and limited food and, of course, drugs. Linda said she needed to figure out who she was now that all of our children had left home. That after long conversations with her girlfriend, Kate, and they agreed that there would be significant changes in our marriage. So, I have no say in our marriage now that Kate makes the decisions, I commented. She gave me a long lecture about male paternalism and how I had subjugated and oppressed her for 30 years, and that would all change and now we would have a female-centered marriage. What the hell are you talking about? I stammered out. Are you claiming that I forced you to drive a BMW, live in a 3,000-foot home with a swimming pool, and travel to Europe three times? while I worked every day and you never worked a day in the last 25 years once our first child was born. Linda didn't respond to my words. She calmly gave me a list of her demands. For starters, I was now forbidden from watching the Super Bowl because everyone knows that after the Super Bowl husbands immediately demand sex from their wives. From now on, she claimed I was no longer allowed to pee standing up because it was a sign of the patriarchy. She demanded I pee sitting down not standing up like a wild animal. She would no longer allow me to initiate intimacy with her. We could only be intimate when she wanted it, and I was to remain motionless on my back while she did what she wanted with me. She also explained that I would be tied up from time to time, and she might even bring over another lover and make me watch, because Kate explained that this was what was best for both of us. And I had to refer to her as Mistress Linda. When I asked why she wasn't wearing her wedding ring, she folded her arms in front of her chest. It's just a modern representation of a slave ring. It's just another way for men to control women. I held up the finger on my left hand that proudly displayed my wedding ring. Then what does my ring signify? Linda lifted up her head and said it was just another manifestation of male dominance and the patriarchal symbol that I owned her. She looked like she expected me to explode. I didn't. I remained calm and explained that I thought she was having a nervous breakdown or was still taking mind-altering drugs. I said I was willing to wait until tomorrow when the drugs she was obviously taking wore off. At home I researched drug rehabilitation clinics but I was afraid it was too late. The drugs she took in New York seemed to have permanently affected her, or maybe they just let the true Linda come out. As Linda opened her suitcase on our bed, she took out what seemed to be a giant-sized dress and a dog leash with a very large collar. She ordered me to put on the dress. You want me to be a transvestite? I yelled. She said that transvestite was an awful word, it was a hate word. She wanted me to be a transsexual, which was the accepted term. I couldn't tell the difference and didn't care. She tried to put the dog collar on me. I tore it from her hands and threw in the trash can. She said that the only way we could be intimate was if I wore the collar, showing that she was dominant and I was her submissive. Then we could have intimacy and she could give birth to another daughter. What if you become pregnant with a boy? I asked. Oh. Then I'd keep having abortions until I was pregnant with another girl. Now, I understand. You really are out of your mind and I'll be damned if I'll let you reproduce your spawn with my sperm. Then I walked out of the master bedroom and locked the door of the guest room behind me. She pounded on the door, but I not only ignored her, but struggled to move a dresser to block the door so she couldn't open it. The next morning, I walked past her in the master bedroom and entered the master bathroom. For the first time in our marriage, I didn't close the bathroom door for privacy, but kept it wide open so she could see me peeing as I stood up, as I had always done since I was three years old. She screamed at me to sit on the toilet instead of standing and marking my territory like a dog. I'm not proud of what I did next, but neither am I ashamed. I walked over to the bed and urinated on her pillows. What are you doing? She screamed. I'm just marking my territory like the dog you claim I am. She grabbed her phone and called her friend Kate, crying that I was being disrespectful and not obeying her the way the two of them had assumed that I would. Kate told her that I had to be punished and that Linda must and I repeat must sleep with someone else to put me in my place while I was tied to a chair and forced to watch. I grabbed the phone from Linda's hand and yelled at Kate. Have you ever had your teeth knocked out by a baseball bat? Well, if you ever and I mean ever speak to my wife again, that's what you'll have to look forward to. I still have friends in New York and for $500 they'll knock out your teeth and break your legs. I want you to think about this. It may not happen this week or this month or even this year, but just as January follows December, I will get my revenge on you some dark night while you're in an elevator or maybe a garage or maybe just walking your dog along Fifth Avenue. If you really piss me off, I may get you attacked multiple times, at least once for each time my wife speaks with you, you stupid meddling bitch. I'm not scared of you, Kate yelled back. Then I picked up the home phone and called information for the number of an airline that flew to New York, while Kate listened. Kate, I've decided to take care of you myself. I'll see you soon, very soon. Linda was crying and shaking. I hung up the phone and grabbed my wife by her shoulders. You have two choices, 
Forget all this bullshit, or I'll see a divorce lawyer today. You don't scare me, she screamed. I'm a grown woman, and I can do whatever I want, and you can't stop me. Why would I want to? I responded. You can do whatever you want, and so can I. I yelled back. The lyrics to the Kenny Rogers song, the gambler played over and over in my head. It was clearly time to fold my cards and not walk away but run. I packed two suitcases with enough clothes for a week, left the house, and drove to a motel where I stayed for a week. I arranged with my boss who was my best friend since high school to fire me for cause. I paid off all of our credit cards, as well as three months on our mortgage. I took all of the rest of our money from our joint savings accounts and gave the money to our daughters. Then I withdrew all of the money from my 401k, paid the tax and spent what was left on a fabulous vacation I'd always dreamed of to Hawaii, Japan and Hong Kong and when I returned, I spent the remainder on a classic 1966 Corvette in Bristol condition. In my absence with Kate's help Linda got a well-paying job with a well-funded faux women's rights organization that lobbied state governments to allow men, dressed up as women, in women's sports teams so they could box or wrestle with real women and beat the crap out of them. It made no sense to me, but it wasn't really any of my business. I would later discover that the organization was funded by a pharmaceutical company that made obscenely expensive drugs to alter the sex of very young children that were paid for by state governments. Linda studied at night for her master's degree in gender studies. There she learned that there are over 25 genders. I thought there were only two, which made me a Neanderthal in the eyes of Linda, her friends and co-workers. One of our daughters cut all ties with Linda, the other, who majored in women's studies completely supports her mother and is offended that I wouldn't wear a dog collar if my wife wanted me to. I tried to reason with her, but it didn't work so I just withdrew the money I had placed in her bank account. As my father taught me, never waste your time arguing with a fool. She cut all ties with me, which broke my heart. Of course, when the next semester began, she begged me to pay her tuition. I refused and told her to ask her well-paid mother for the money. Linda and my daughter were both feminist to the core, except when it came to paying for things. Linda refused to pay her tuition because she only spent money on herself, and tuition was my responsibility because I was a man. It's funny how they both hated being dependent on the patriarchy except when the bills came due. I quickly got a minimum wage job at a fast food restaurant. I didn't care. I wanted to keep my income very low for at least one month before I filed the papers for our divorce. I moved into an apartment above the garage of my friend Stan. I lived on Big Macs and fries for a month, punctuated only by the occasional Egg McMuffin. I love fast food, so I was in heaven though standing on my feet all day was exhausting. True to my word I hired a divorce lawyer. I lost my house and my peace of mind in the divorce. I didn't pay alimony but received it from my ex which pissed her to no end. She repeatedly ranted at the judge that he was just a tool of the patriarchy and was fined $500 and two days in jail for contempt. After the divorce decree was issued, my wife posted on Facebook how happy she was without me. Now she could live as a free and independent woman in my former home with her girlfriend Kate. I didn't think Linda was gay. Though she may be bi, she clearly preferred men when they were available, but now it seemed they had to wear dresses and dog collars which Linda claims is perfectly normal. What passes for normal in Linda's eyes strikes me as insane. Linda had always flirted with my tall handsome friend Stan. I asked Stan to be intimate with Linda in a way that her girlfriend Kate would discover. Stan was eager to comply once I assured him that I wouldn't hold this against him. He ran into Linda at her job, flirted with her, seduced her and took her back to her house, while Kate wasn't there. I texted Kate with a message informing her that Linda was two-timing her. I could never have predicted what Kate did next. She drove her car back to Linda's house so quickly that she rammed it into the living room bay window. Then she raced out of the car stepping over the broken glass and furniture into the kitchen where she grabbed a steak knife, which she used to slash Linda's throat. Stan tried to stop her but had his arms sliced as a reward. He ran away and when he was safely outside, he phoned 911. Kate was arrested and convicted for two counts of attempted murder. She's now a happy lesbian in a prison which is what she spent her life aiming at. Linda didn't die but her vocal cords were severed and she could no longer speak without the use of some electronic gadget that she held next to her throat when she spoke. She sounded like a stupid Stephen Hawkins. As my way of apologizing to Stan, I signed over title to my Corvette to him, which made him quite happy. Linda tried to reconnect with me, but I refused to speak with her. Three years later, my new wife and our three-month-old baby were in a shopping mall when I saw Linda also pushing a baby carriage. Standing next to her was a guy who looked like an NFL linebacker. When the linebacker turned around, I was stunned to see that he was a she. A closer inspection hinted that he really was a he, with bright red lipstick and wearing a short dress which accentuated his hairy legs, 
and falsy filled bra. My eyes met Linda's eyes, one of which was black and bruised, but neither of us said a word. Her new spouse played on a woman's volleyball team where he sent three real women to the hospital for concussion injuries after he zealously and intentionally spiked the ball directly at their heads. Now let's check the second story. The letter from William Travis to his family began. If you're reading this then I've died of cancer so I have nothing to lose by making this confession to you, my wife and three sons. I was a fourth generation Texas Ranger before I joined the United States Secret Service. I was an agent in Dallas that horrible November morning in 1963. To my eternal shame, I would later learn that I hadn't been just a bystander but unwittingly played a part of this epic tragedy. This is my story of love, betrayal and revenge. No not revenge, let's call it justice or maybe redemption. I was a decent looking guy. I never had trouble getting dates, but Serena Fisher was in a class all her own. She could have been a model or a movie star, but instead she was a new secretary at the Secret Service in Washington. She was a 5 foot 9 inch blonde, almost as tall as me, with a body that gave new meaning to the phrase, body by Fisher. Every single agent and a few of the married ones made passes at her but she showed no interest in them. Instead I was the unluckiest guy on earth who she flirted with seduced and then moved in with me all inside of six weeks. Unmarried people living together was a big no-no in 1963, but we didn't care. We just kept it quiet. Everyone at the office thought we were just dating. I was the envy of every guy I knew, but in reality, I was just her first victim, the first fish on her line. She singled me out like a lion picks out one gazelle for dinner. If I could go back in time, I would strangle that beautiful neck of hers with my bare hands on the night of our first date instead of falling hopelessly in love with her. During our time together, she never gave me a reason to doubt her faithfulness to either me or our country. I was wrong on both counts. Her loyalty to both her boyfriend and her country melted faster than an April snow in Washington, D.C. As an agent permanently assigned to guarding the president, I did a lot of traveling with the president and his wife. Serena was very understanding that this was my job, and we both understood how important it was to our country. Among my duties was to travel with a team to the site of a visit in advance and determine the safest car route for the president to travel in these cities. Two weeks before the president and first lady traveled to Dallas, I was there as part of the team mapping the route of the president's motorcade. I arrived back home in Virginia late at night totally exhausted and left my maps in my briefcase on the kitchen table in my home and went asleep next to Serena. In my bathroom, I thought I smelled the scent of a man's cologne that I never used, but put it down to my exhaustion. I awoke in the middle of the night and discovered that my Serena wasn't next to me in bed, but in the kitchen. I thought nothing of it, but the next morning as I examined my papers, they seemed to have been in a different order than I thought I had left them. I just assumed that I had been so tired the night before that I remembered their order incorrectly. A few days later I traveled with the President and First Lady to Dallas, Texas. The trip started out so well. I stood on the running board of the convertible presidential limousine, talking with the President as we were about to enter Dealey Plaza. I'll never drink again. Bill Travis groaned to the smiling man in the back seat of the convertible. The boss laughed and pat Travis on the shoulder, then waved some more to the admiring crowd. Last night, the boss drank Travis into the ground. If you wanted to travel with the boss, you had to drink with the boss. Turning his head towards the glaring sun turned up the buzzing in Travis' head. He fought the pain and inspected each window of a five-story building. Travis, when we get back, I'll teach you to drink Irish whiskey, the boss promised. Let William do his job. The boss's wife glared at her husband and smiled at Travis. Only the boss's wife called him William. To everyone else he was Travis or the Boy Scout. Travis always gave 100%. That's why they called him the Boy Scout. Travis wasn't a big drinker. He lacked the talent or the taste for it. Late last night, after a difficult meeting concluded, the boss removed the tie from his collar and the cork from a whiskey bottle. He proclaimed that each culture tries to justify the pain God puts us through. The Greeks created myths. The Jews wrote the Bible. Only the Irish truly understood the real pain, the futility of life, so they invented whiskey and he poured around. He was the smartest person Travis ever met and the most charming. Travis was 25, young for his job. He couldn't look past the relentless Texas sun into an office building's upper floors. He put on his sunglasses. It cut his peripheral vision but made the pain tolerable. He wasn't doing his job properly. It hurt his pride that he wasn't giving 100%. Their convertible continued down the empty Texas street past pavements filled with onlookers. Nothing good ever happened to Bill in Texas. Last night the boss asked about Bill's father. He was insistent. That's when Travis began drinking. He could never talk about his father without a drink. Travis spent childhood summers on his family's Texas ranch. 
He hadn't returned since his father died. His mind's eye filled with the memory. Bill Travis' father lying dead on the lap of Bill's older brother. Blood poured out of the gunshot wound in his head. Bill shuddered. The boss asked if he felt better. Travis turned toward the back seat and tried to smile. I'm sorry, sir. I'm letting you down. Hell, it's my fault for getting you drunk. The boss was over six feet tall, but not as tall as Travis, who ducked as the boss waved to someone on the pavement. He heard three rifle shots. He didn't know where the first one was fired from, but the second and third came from in front of him. This isn't happening. Dear God, this isn't happening. He prayed his life slipped away from the man behind him. His boss, President John Kennedy. Secret Service Agent Bill Travis jumped into the back seat and covered JFK's torn body with his own, prepared to take the next bullet for the young president. Travis grabbed Jackie Kennedy's frail hand. He pulled her down onto the floor of the car. The president's blood covered them both. Travis wished it were his blood instead. He saw the opening in the president's head. Travis hoped for another round. One that would take his life too and stop the endless pain he felt. God, if he dies don't let me live through this day. The killers stopped firing. Travis was sentenced to life. The presidential limousine sped toward the Park Lane Memorial Hospital. Travis removed the president's bloody necktie and tilted back his head to give him more air. He placed the tie in his pocket and prayed that President Kennedy would live. Slowly Travis grasped the enormity of the wound. If the president survived, he would no longer be a functioning man. Travis tried to pray that President Kennedy would not live, but his mind refused to form the words. Other words filled his mind. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, echoed in his head as the limousine stopped at the hospital. A phalanx of agents surrounded their fallen leader and his wife. Doctors met them at the entrance and raced with them through antiseptic-smelling corridors. Seven agents guarded the operating room with drawn guns. Travis and another agent, Herb, took Mrs. Kennedy into a waiting room filled with magazines graced by her picture. Herb bit his lower lip but couldn't stop the tears. The young wife splashed cold water on her face, took a deep breath and hurried back towards the operating room. Slowly the chief surgeon walked outside. He pulled the gauze mask from his face and tried to talk. Pain contorted his face. No one could make out his words, but everyone understood them. Jackie journeyed into the operating room while a sobbing nurse crossed herself and pulled a sheet up over the face of her president. The young widow asked everyone to leave. She wanted. She needed a last moment alone with her husband. The agents guarded the glass room. They didn't look behind them. Though unable to protect their president's life, they could still guard his privacy. Bernie Walston, the Secret Service agent in charge of security for this trip, site control, ran down the hall with Vice President Johnson and his Secret Service contingent. The faces of JFK's agents telegraphed what they learned to Walston and the new commander-in-chief. We can't guess how big this thing is. We're flying back to Washington immediately with Mrs. Kennedy and, and President Johnson. Walston looked ashen. The normally confident, perhaps overconfident, man was jumpy and looked close to a coronary. President Johnson looked carefully at the seven and spoke slowly. My regular guards will remain with me. They know me and I know them. The men who guarded the vice president were the B team. Bill and the others used to mock them, but now they had the final laugh. You seven escort President Kennedy's body to Air Force One and back to Washington, the new president ordered. He made little effort to hide the contempt he felt for them. The former first lady came out and spoke with the new president. She asked him if her husband could be buried in Arlington National Cemetery. President Johnson couldn't speak, but nodded his agreement and left with his guards. The woman stood silently a moment. She looked down at her blood-covered dress, then turned to the seven agents who had sworn an oath to protect her husband's life with their own. Travis would have rather faced hell. Bill decided to escort Mrs. Kennedy safely back to Washington before he killed himself. Several agents wheeled the gurney carrying the late president out of the operating room, past Travis, and towards the opening elevator door. Three men marched out of the elevator, two stood at least six feet five inches tall, garbed in the uniforms of Texas Rangers. Bill's brother and his grandfather had been Rangers as had he. He knew all about them. The third man wore a small cowboy hat and a business suit. One Ranger blocked the president's gurney. The man wearing the cowboy hat showed papers proving he was from the coroner's office. He spoke to Mrs. Kennedy but looked at the ground in front of her. He was impounding a corpse for an autopsy. The president's body couldn't return to Washington for at least a week. Travis looked at Mrs. Kennedy. She started swaying and leaned against the wall for support. She tried to speak but couldn't. Travis went face to face with the sweating man. This is wrong. Don't do it. The coroner jabbed Travis in the chest with his finger. I'm really sorry and all, 
but I've got a job to do. Bill Travis looked down at the man's finger which touched Bill's bloody shirt. The body stays here. Travis shook his head. Get out of my way. I'm taking the president back to Washington. Travis had no desire to continue living. The coroner removed his cowboy hat and wiped his brow. You and who else? Travis thrust his 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol into the man's stomach. He looked to Mrs. Kennedy for guidance. She said nothing to stop him. Her eyes, glazed with rage, focused on the coroner. Travis stood alone. No one spoke. Agents and rangers examined one another. Each decided his willingness to die over this. One by one the agents moved their coats away from their guns as they circled the three Texans. The Texas rangers looked to the coroner and then to Mrs. Kennedy. They weren't prepared to die. They stepped aside. The agents and the former first lady moved the president's body into the elevator to begin his final journey to Arlington National Cemetery. Mrs. Kennedy studied Travis for a quiet moment, then grasped his hands in her blood-soaked palms. 10,000 volts went through him. The chaos, the passion, the self-loathing of that morning fused into a point of rage. The fury was no longer inwardly directed towards his destruction. Travis understood why he must go on living. Now Travis had a purpose, a goal, a compulsion. He looked at the silent woman. Please believe me. I'll find the men who did this. I'll get them. I swear I will. Mrs. Kennedy was silent. Hours later, after Air Force One had landed, Bill Travis walked into his apartment as forlorn as a soldier whose country was just defeated. The apartment smelled empty. There was no odor of cooked food. The heat was off and the apartment was cold. As Bill looked around, he saw that all of Serena's belongings were gone. He searched the apartment but found no evidence that she had ever even lived there. He sat down cold, tired and trying to understand what was going on. Why did she leave him, and especially why on this terrible day? Emotionally, he shifted between sadness and anger. He fell asleep in a comfortable chair, without even taking off his clothes, save for his shoes. The next morning, he arrived at Secret Service Headquarters, the unhappiest place on earth. Everyone there felt like a failure. As he walked through the halls, he could see that no one looked anyone else in the eye. He walked into the office of Barry, his supervisor, and explained that his girlfriend had deserted him. He asked permission to use the agency's resources to find her, so he would know that was going on, why she left him on this, the most horrible week of his adult life. His supervisor said that he would assign specialists in this area to find her. Three hours later Bill Travis was summoned to Barry's office. Inside were three nondescript men. Barry offered Bill a shot of whiskey, which Bill declined. Barry insisted and Bill swallowed the Johnny Walker red in one gulp. It burned his throat on the way down, and the pain in his stomach took his mind off of the pain in his heart, if only for a second. He wiped his lips and sat down. Barry pushed two pieces of paper in front of Bill. Here is Serena's birth certificate. It's dated December 5, 1940. Bill nodded in understanding. Then Barry pushed another piece of paper in front of him. Here's her death certificate. It's dated December 20, 1940. Another Serena Fisher graduated UCLA in 1960. She had a different birthday than our Serena. So in short, we have no idea who Serena really is or was. We just know she wasn't Serena Fisher. We dusted her desk, phone etc. for fingerprints. Whoever she is she smart. Every surface was wiped clean. Her fingerprint file and her personnel files is missing. She's a ghost. Her background wasn't real. It's called a legend. It's my guess that she worked for a foreign intelligence agency. That would explain how professionally her identity was created. The real questions are, Number one, why did some organization go to all this trouble? And two, since she vanished a day before Dallas, was that a coincidence, which I doubt, or was she involved in the assassination? Bill spoke up. When I returned from my advance planning in Dallas, along with the map of the president's route, I had a hunch that she had gone though my papers in my briefcase, but I couldn't be sure and couldn't figure out why she would even want to. Now, of course, in hindsight, it all seems clear why she attached herself to me at the hip from her first day here because I always knew the presidential route on each trip the president took. I don't know how, or how long it will take me, but I'll find the bitch and bring her back for justice. If for some reason I can't bring her back alive, I'll blow her brains out and I don't care that I just made that confession in front of all of you. In the days that followed Bill Travis became a mere shadow of the man he used to be. He was no longer considered competent enough to continue mapping out presidential trips. His superiors however took pity on him. They didn't fire, or even demote him. The Secret Service takes care of their own. They just transferred him from presidential security to the anti-counterfeiting unit. It was another department in the Secret Service, both of which operated under the Department of the Treasury. Bill threw himself into his work. 
The hard work and long hours help him stop obsessing about Dallas. He requested a transfer out of Washington to anywhere else. It didn't matter. He didn't want anything to remind him of his pre-Dallas life. He ended up in Chicago, which had become a nationwide hub for counterfeit $100 bills. Bill was all business there. He didn't go out drinking with his colleagues or socialize with anyone. Except for his work, Bill lived the life of a hermit. In the years since the assassination Bill withdrew from life except for his job. He didn't date, didn't make friends or interact with others than a house cat. Bill never believed the Warren Commission report. He believed there had been a conspiracy and he an unwitting pawn led around the chessboard by his girlfriend. He spent all of his spare time researching any and all conspiracy theories. Some thought JFK was murdered on Fidel Castro's orders, or perhaps Khrushchev. Others believed it was the CIA or the Mafia. Well, still others thought it was the U.S. Army because the president wanted to withdraw from Vietnam. A large group of people thought that it was the Federal Reserve Bank. There were even those who felt it was a giant conspiracy consisting of all of those groups, as well as President Johnson. Travis couldn't decide which theory made the most sense to him, so he just went about his job taking down counterfeiters. He did it very well and soon earned a promotion to head the Chicago office. There may have been a certain amount of sympathy involved in the promotion. Everyone felt bad about Bill's role in Dallas and his girlfriend's betrayal. Information about her possible involvement in the assassination was never divulged to anyone but the top men at the Secret Service. If word got out, it would repudiate the Warren Commission report's claim of a lone gunman. Sam Giancana was the boss of the syndicate in Chicago. The Chicago syndicate was also heavily involved in counterfeiting U.S. currency, so Bill spent a lot of time investigating Sam. There was constant 24-hour surveillance on Sam. Bill spent hours watching those films trying to find a way to pin the counterfeiting on Sam and put him away. Bill sat in a darkened room watching the latest 16mm surveillance film about Sam when Bill spit out the mouthful of Pepsi in his mouth. There on the screen, next to Sam was a beautiful black-haired woman. Bill realized that the woman was his ex-girlfriend Serna, with just a different hair color and a few years older. Further research indicated that Sam had helped stuff the ballot boxes in Chicago to get JFK elected with a promise that JFK would stop his brother, Robert Kennedy, from further investigating the mob. This deal was hammered out by Joe Kennedy, their father who had been involved with the mob since he ran booze during Prohibition. The mob was furious that they had been double-crossed. As far as Bill could see, this explained why the president was assassinated and how Serena and her lover Sam Giancana were involved. Robert Kennedy tried to get Giancana permanently deported and Giancana wanted RFK dead. There was a lot of bad blood between those two. Giancana could do nothing against RFK however so long as JFK was alive. Bill knew that the Warren Commission report was bullshit. He also realized that Sam must have had important powerful government allies on the commission to control it and keep it from uncovering the truth. This meant that if Bill went up the chain of command with his theory and evidence, he would be dead within a few days, if not hours. Bill left the office and went for a walk along Lake Michigan to clear his head. He knew what had to be done and that he had to do it alone. After reviewing weeks of film, he saw a pattern emerge. Serena, or whatever her real name was, visited Sam on Tuesday and Friday evenings at exactly 7 p.m. She let herself in with her own key. She never stayed for more than two or three hours. She always wore a large hat and sunglasses to conceal her identify from the obvious FBI cameras and cars parked in front of the house. That weekend, Bill chartered a private plane and pilot with his own money and flew over Giancana's house. He saw that he could leave through Sam's back door scale a short fence and walk away down the next street behind Sam's house to an untitled motorcycle that he would park there on judgment night. The next Tuesday Bill hid in a nondescript car in front of Sam's house. When Serena left, he followed her to her three-unit apartment building three miles away. After breaking open the mailboxes in the foyer, he learned that she was living under the name of Brenda Stevens. Bill's next stop was to buy two unregistered 22 caliber semi-automatic pistols and a box of hollow point bullets at gun show that couldn't be traced back to him. The bullets would disintegrate on impact, making it impossible to determine what gun had fired them. In his basement, Bill fashioned two silencers out of automobile oil filters. In the event that one gun jammed, he had a spare. After buying a second-hand motorcycle for cash and not registering it, he bought a black-haired wig and sunglasses that were identical to the ones that he saw Serena use when entering Sam's house. Bill also bought a dress identical to the one that Serena wore to Sam's house the previous week. Then as a final touch he bought a UPS driver outfit at a secondhand store. Bill put everything in a box, drove his motorcycle to Serena's apartment, rang the bell and in a disguised voice said he had a UPS package for Brenda Stevens with a package in one hand and a clipboard in his other hand. He wore a fake mustache and beard as well as a blonde-haired wig to cover his black hair. 
He could tell that Brenda, aka Serena, looked through the peephole before she opened the door. She told him to just leave the package, but Bill said that she had to sign for it as he held up the clipboard to the peephole. Serena opened the door a crack, and Bill threw himself into the door knocking Serena down in the process. Bill stuck a gag in her mouth and punched her in her stomach to stop her struggling. He straddled her while she lay on the ground and tried to question her. Serena reached into her left boot and drew out a dagger which she used to slash Bill's left arm. Left with no choice as Serena was about to cut his throat, Bill shot her in her stomach three times. Where is the key to Giancana's house? Bill demanded of the bleeding woman as he put the barrel of the gun in front of her mouth. It's on my keychain, she said as she pointed to a dining room table. I had no choice. Sam would have tortured and killed me if I didn't help him, but I really liked you. That wasn't an act. She looked pleadingly into his eyes, trying to save her life, trying to distract Bill so she could find another way to kill him. Do you still love me? She asked. Those were the last words she would ever say as Bill put the gun to her left ear, told her that he still loved her and shot her in her head three more times. Was Bill just seeking revenge for her role in the assignation? Or was he motivated by her adultery and personally betraying him? Bill couldn't swear which motive was more controlling. Bill's outer clothes, his UPS uniform was covered in Serena's blood, as well as his own. After ransacking the apartment to make it look like a robbery, he wiped up his blood from the ground and put her knife in his box. He removed the bloody uniform and shoes, placing them into the box. He was careful not to step in the blood as he left the murder scene. Bill rode his motorcycle to Sam's house, but stopped on the way to throw away the bloody evidence in three separate trash dumpsters. Parking the bike on the block behind Sam's house, Bill found a dark area to put on the dress, hat, and sunglasses. He walked around the block to Sam's house, rang the doorbell three times as he had observed Serena do in the surveillance film, then used the key to let himself in. I'm in the kitchen, Sam yelled out. Get ready for a great dinner. Bill walked towards the man leaning his head down so that the hat blocked Sam from seeing Bill's face as he held the gun inside of a bag that advertised the name of a local liquor store. Sam instantly knew something was wrong and reached toward the counter and a Smith & Wesson revolver there. Bill shot him before he could reach it. Bill shot him a total of seven times, as he silently whispered to himself that this was for President Kennedy. He didn't know if the FBI had bugged the place and didn't want his voice recorded if they had. Bill walked out of the back of the house to his waiting motorcycle, drove it to the lake where he threw away all of the evidence. After wiping all fingerprints from the bike, he left it to be stolen in a high crime area and then boarded a bus to a mile from his house, then walked the rest of the way home. The newspapers were filled with stories about the assassination of a suspect and the murder of President Kennedy. Bill had used a different gun to kill Serena, so there was no direct evidence to connect the two murders and Serena's looked like a robbery gone wrong. Two months later while on an official trip to Secret Service headquarters in Washington, D.C. Bill made a pilgrimage to Arlington National Cemetery in the grave of President Kennedy with a bouquet of roses to lay close to the grave. Bill broke down in tears as he confessed to his former boss what he had done to avenge JFK's murder. I didn't take out the actual shooters, Mr. President, but I did take out the demon who ordered it and the accomplice who made it possible. That act of confession was also an act of atonement and redemption. After Bill's silent confession to his dead president, Bill heard birds chirping. It was as if he heard them for the first time since Dallas. He looked around at the beautiful cloud-free sunshine warming his body and even his soul. Bill stood up and straightened his shoulders. He understood that he was finally able to release the enormous burden he had carried on his shoulders for all those years since Dallas and begin to again live his life. He smelled the fragrance of the roses as he gently placed the flowers down near the grave. The symbolism wasn't lost on him. It was time to stop his isolation from life and once again smell the roses. Dear listeners, sending loads of love to Ronald Burns for his contribution and to all our listeners thank you for being part of this literary journey with us. And if you want to share your work with us, please send your work at the email mentioned in the description box and we will publish it for our listeners at Lost Love Chronicles. Please share your thoughts in the comments section and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.